All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly episode 69, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, first of all, apologies for starting the stream earlier than I usually do, but I really want to finish it before it will get super hot outside. I'm not a fan of that, so... So you know what, I'm just gonna start now and uh, you know, if you guys are late a bit, I hope you just rewatch this on YouTube or just forgive me for doing that, but I'm not ready to die from the heat. So let us, let us get started with the news, shall we? We got some stuff, not particularly many, but there are some very interesting articles uh, today. So let us get started. The first thing as usual is the getting started section with all the articles that you need to get started with uh, a variety of technologies. The first one we got here today is what is Electron and why is it so polarizing? So if you're still not sure what Electron is and uh, how to use it and why is it so polarizing, what are the caveats and things about it that make people hate it, then this article is for you. It does a pretty good job at introducing the Electron, explaining what it is, how it works and uh, what you should keep in mind when developing for it. Uh, hey, Apishek, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got an introduction to Stencil.js, a pretty nice and extensive tutorial that shows you how to use Stencil.js to build a web component. So if you were curious about that, do check it out. This basically has everything you need to get started from the very scratch to testing the component in the browser to um, exporting it and stuff like this. So basically, if you're interested in web components and Stencil.js specifically, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is anomalies in JavaScript arrow functions, or I would actually rename it to what's the difference between arrow functions and normal functions, because it's not really anomalies, that's just how the arrow functions work. And this article does a pretty good job of explaining what the differences between the arrow functions and normal functions are. But I, yeah, again, I wouldn't call this anomalies. So if you're just getting started with ES6 and uh, getting into arrow functions, or maybe you had some problems figuring out, you know, why, why you don't have arguments um, parameter or why you cannot use it as a constructor. This article does a very good job of explaining all of that. So if you are confused by some parts of the error functions, make sure to read that. The title is not the best, to be honest. <laughs> okay, next thing we got here is call me maybe callbacks for beginners. Um, exactly as the title says, explains what the callbacks are and how do they work pretty well and shows uh, as well how are they used and when they can be helpful, including, you know, stuff like events, network requests, and higher order functions. So if you are just getting started with JavaScript, this article is for you and it's going to explain what the callbacks are and how they work in a pretty good manner. All right, next thing we got here is Next.js versus Create React app, whose apps are more performant. Spoiler, of course, is Next.js because it has server-side rendering, but maybe you were still confused as to why would you use Next.js over Create React app and you weren't sure if server-side rendering is actually that helpful, well, this article has uh, implements essentially the same app using Create React App and Next.js, and then compares the performance using the um, Lighthouse audits from the Chrome DevTools to show you that the server-side performance is indeed very, very helpful. And uh, this, I will just show you the, the results. So the Create React App expectedly scores 40 out of 100, which, you know, the first meaningful paint is like two seconds um, after you start loading the page, I think it's like six seconds or whatever. And then if you use the next JS, yes, you get 0 0.8 se seconds because it is server-side rendered hey. So if you wanted to have a look uh, in a bit more in-depth performance comparison of Next and Create React App, then do check this one out. Okay, and I think this is, no, not the last one. The next one we got here is the uh, simple explanation of functional pipe in JavaScript. A pretty good write-up from uh, one of the uh, maintainers and I think authors of RxJS, Ben Lesh, on the functional pipe or the pipeline operator as it's called that is gonna be coming to the JavaScript spec quite soon and uh, why do we actually need it and how does it actually work? So it starts by outlining uh, what the, um, you know, what kind of things you typically do. So we have the functions, we have the functional programming where you can actually chain it, but this is not very convenient to read. So we're gonna have a pipe function that's gonna make it more convenient, but you know, it's still not quite readable. And then it comes down to saying, okay, now we actually have a pipeline operator that makes it all super nice. There's obviously more in-depth explanation of that. So if you're curious about it and um, wanted as, I guess, a bit of introduction to functional programming, then do check this one out. It's very, uh, yeah, actually pretty good. 
Uh, hey, Shmelly Mor uh, Shmelly Ork. Uh, hey, Shmelly Ork. Welcome to the stream. That's quite a nickname you have there. <laughs> All right, continuing. We got uh, building better React forms with Formic. A pretty nice tutorial to Formic uh, that basically showcases how to use it to build a relatively complex uh, form in this case. So if you're working with forms and you were working uh, with them in React and you wanted a better way to do this, then definitely check this one out. Uh, Formic is a pretty good library, especially when you need to work with the complex forms. And this article does a good job of uh, showcasing how exactly it works and how to use it. All right, and the last thing that we have in the getting started section today is deploying a Node.js application to DigitalOcean with HTTPS. This is a very detailed tutorial that gives you a step-by-step -step on, first of all, how to set up your DigitalOcean uh, virtual server, then, you know, create a droplet, root login into it, create a new user, add public key authentication, remove the password authentication, stuff like this. And then go into the setting up the Nginx, configuring firewall, adding the main name. So basically everything you need to set up your uh, virtual server to serve your node application through Nginx. So this is specifically because Nginx is going to be handling HTTPS with Let's Encrypt here. Uh, and uh, yeah, then just running your node app using PM2, if I remember correctly. It's nothing super special, but it's a very good tutorial that essentially, you know, if you never had to manage a server, it does an amazing job of explaining every step you would want to take with it, essentially. There we go. Okay, that is it for the getting started section. Now we are coming to a short articles and news section that nonetheless has some very interesting things here. So the first article is the cost of JavaScript in 2019. Uh, there was a really cool talk on Perf Matters Conference 2019 from Adias Mani. And uh, this is essentially a write-up that um, represents this talk in a blog format. Uh, hey, Donna, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much for your donation. It is always highly appreciated. Uh, coming back to the topic on the hand. So yes, uh, first of all, if you have time, please watch the video itself. Uh, Adios Mani is amazingly uh, well, um, presenting amazingly well is what I want to say. And it's always really cool to watch his talks. But if you prefer reading, then the article itself is also really cool. Um, there is a ton of various statistics and details here as well. So this is sort of a follow up on the, you know, on changes in JavaScript world, I guess, over the years. And uh, what I want to highlight is this picture that's, you know, from one of the slides that shows the JavaScript processing times for Reddit. So Reddit is a relatively popular website, right? And you would think that they, they have a relatively optimal uh, website, but it uh, turns out now it's actually really bad. So if you take, um, here's the difference of JavaScript processing time. So it's, this is not, not accounting for network, not accounting for, you know, transferring the data. This is just when the browser gets the JavaScript and then starts parsing it and then basically executes it, right? So there's two threads, main thread and worker thread. So the Reddit thankfully actually uses some worker threads to speed it up a bit. But here's just look at the difference. So if you take the high end mobile like Pixel 3, it takes like about, I don't know, 300 milliseconds to do both main and worker threads, right? If you take an average mobile like Moto G4, you already get above one second. So it takes around one second for a main thread and then like two, 300 milliseconds more for the worker thread. Then if you take the low end mobile like Alcatel One X, I honestly have no idea what this mobile is, but you know, this probably quite widespread. I, as far as I know, the low end Android phones actually account for the majority of Android phones out there. This is actually what you want to be optimizing for. So if you take the low end phone, uh, low end mobile phone, uh, it takes about two seconds for the main thread and one more, or I guess half more, for the worker thread, that is two and a half seconds just to process JavaScript, not accounting for loading times, not accounting for transfer, not accounting for handshakes or network issues or anything else. This is insane. So if you are interested in JavaScript performance and how it changed over time and how does it look in 2019 and what you should be looking at in 2019, then I would highly recommend looking through this article. And once again, if you have time, just watch the video. It is amazing and really cool. So quite highly recommended. ES6 is, yes, ES6 is very nice. I totally agree. And all the additions to JavaScript so far has been freaking amazing. So um, yeah, cannot argue with that. <laughs> all right, 
Continuing, we got the secret of good electron apps. Um, pretty cool write up from James Long, who's been uh, working on a new app called Actual, which is a personal finance manager. It is built with Electron. And this is sort of his insights into how they managed to make it, um, I guess, to make it have a smaller footprint than the apps like Slack, for example, which it's, you know, more than a gigabyte of RAM when you just launch it and then becomes terribly slow anyway. Um, so they, their app, even though it does eat around the 140 megabytes of memory, still a lot better and it's still Electron. So it turns out the trick to it is quite simple. You just, since you know the Electron consists of the Chromium and Node.js, actually it seems like if you put all your processing and all your logic in the backend, in the server side, right, the Node side, you will actually eat a lot less memory. It seems like the node is way more efficient in managing it than the Chromium, which I guess should be expected. And there's the repo here that showcases how exactly to achieve that using the APT channels for communication and how you can debug this and stuff like this. So um, if you are working with Electron, I actually, you know, like reading this article, I was like, this sounds so obvious. Why haven't I thought about that? Because I used to throw all the logic into Chromium part as well, because, you know, it's just simple, right? But um, looking at this, it makes so much sense. So if you're working with Electron and you wanted to make it more efficient and faster, then definitely absolutely read this article. There are some really cool tips here. And again, there's a source code that showcases how to uh, structure this properly, how to structure your app properly. Maybe you can even use it as a starter because it is a very basic example. But yes, Electron apps can be quite efficient. And I mean, you know, we already had quite a bunch of examples of uh, really nice Electron apps like VS Code or Discord or Actual in this case. And uh, yes, it's about time people stop giving Electron a bad name and uh, maybe you as a developer can help it and build a um, really good Electron app. So there you go. All right. Continuing, we got one simple trick to optimize React re-renders. I freaking hate titles like this, but it's from Mr. Kenzie Dots and it's an amazingly cool article. So the premise of the article is essentially to answer or I guess to expand on a tweet he did uh, quite some time ago is uh, titled, if you give React the same element you gave it on the last render, it won't bother re-rendering the element. This is essentially the in-depth explanation of what this means in context of React in a form of blog post, right? So without using React Memo, Pure Components or Component Shoot Update. And there's an example of using the nested component that essentially won't re-render if you pass it as a prop. And uh, if that sounds confusing, then I would absolutely encourage you to read that. It's as usual and uh, bloody pop-ups. Uh, as usual, it's a really well-written blog post and it does a very good job of explaining all the performance related things in React and how does React works under the hood when comparing the elements that are rendered into the three, what you should keep in mind when building those uh, such a threes and um, how you can use it in your real world apps. So, and there's a demo obviously, so there you go. So if you're working with React and was wondering how exactly do you uh, limit the re-renders, especially within the functional components that use the hooks, do check this one out. It will give you quite a good starting point, I would say. Okay, next thing we got here is top 10 component commandments. Uh, list of 10 practical commandments that you should try to follow when building uh, components and their API for other people's to use. That are essentially uh, some just, you know, list of bad, bad, bad practices. No, that's not the thing, best practices um, that, yeah, will allow you to build a better components, hopefully. Hey, Xstorm, welcome to the stream. All right, um, yeah, so I mean, most of them are actually super straightforward, you know, something, things that are might seem a bit obvious, I guess, like document the usage, have storybooks and good, docu uh, good documentation allow contextual semantics, avoid Boolean props because they are confusing, use props children, let the parents hook into internal logic when needed, spread the remaining props and stuff like this. So if you're building components, I guess for React specifically, because the article uh, predominantly talks about React, make sure to check this one out. Maybe it will help you make your components a bit better. Okay. Next thing we got here is adding a WebAssembly component to React app. A pretty nice write-up showcasing how you could use assembly scripts to build a WebAssembly component. 
and then integrate it into your React app to do something. In this case, if I remember correctly, they're doing factorial. Yes, exactly. So you're going to be writing a factorial WebAssembly script uh, and then using it in React app to actually calculate factorial, which is, as you might imagine, quite a heavy operation. This is relatively straightforward and quite nice. Um, uh, hi from Italy. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. Let me try to read your username. <laughs> Uh, Massimo Avis uh, Avisati? Massimo Avisati, is that correct? Hello, Massimo Avisati, welcome to the stream. I hope I did not butcher your username. I'm really happy to hear that I have a, a fan in Italy. This is really awesome. So thank you very much for joining us. Okay, um, right. Uh, I think this is the last article we got here for today. It is titled, uh, Forget About Component Life Cycles and Start Thinking in Effects. A pretty neat look into how you can uh, transfer your, I guess, mindset from thinking about the components lifecycle, you know, did mount, did unmount, will unmount, and so on and so forth, and start thinking in a more functional use effect or effects way, I guess, right? So if you're still getting into the new hooks React side and you're still a bit confused about how to switch from the uh, lifecycle into the effects, then this article is for you. It does a really good job of uh, building this sort of mental, uh, the mental, mental mapping from the life cycles into the hooks, is specifically use effect hook. So if you were confused about React, uh, how do React lifecycle maps into the effects, then do check this one out. It is actually quite good. Okay, that is it for the articles and news. We got some uh, tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness here. Not that many as well. I guess everyone is just dead from the heat wave. But uh, there are still some cool things here. So the first one we got here is the symbol prototype description is now available in Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Node.js. So uh, if you never heard of, like if you ever use symbols, you know that you cannot actually get the symbol uh, string, right, normally. So if you do two string, you'll actually get the whole symbol thing. And if you want the value of it, you would actually need to do slice, which is what you typically see in the code typically used for debugging like 90% of the cases, I guess, maybe in 99. I mean, it worked, but it was a pain in the ass. So now we can just do symbol.description and it works in all the major browsers, which is uh, quite convenient. So obviously no Internet Explorer support, but as far as I remember, Internet Explorer doesn't actually have symbol support as well. So there you go. If you're working with symbols, you should be a bit happier. Right? Next thing we got here is the performance tip that is actually extracted from the coast of the JavaScript in 2019 article. Uh, if your web app ships large JSON-like configurations as JavaScript object literals, consider using JSON parse instead. It loads much faster. Ah, I, God damn it! <laughs> it loads much faster, especially for the code loads. So this is a very interesting um, observation, basically. Uh, yeah, if you do a cold load, then object literal would actually load slower than json.parse of the same exact object literal. I think um, frameworks like Snex.js and Webpack are already implementing this as a sort of integrated optimization for the code bundling that speeds up your JavaScript parsing, which is just a bit strange, you know, it's like, Object literal is parsed slower than JSON parse, okay, I guess. But uh, nonetheless, it's very interesting. So if you are looking to squeeze this few milliseconds from parsing your um, JavaScript file on a cold load, then do look at this optimization. Maybe it will help you quite a bit. Okay, next thing we got here is the announcement from the Postman team. It now supports GraphQL. So you can actually use Postman to send GraphQL requests to GraphQL API. And uh, yes, if you are using Postman and working on GraphQL, I guess that's uh, good news for you. Next thing we got here is the introduction of tracking prevention in Microsoft Edge preview builds. So it seems like Microsoft is going all ham on the uh, new Edge browser and uh, they are now integrating the tracking protection right into it, um, which is basically mimicking what Safari and Firefox does, which is, to be honest, quite awesome. It is for now just behind the flag. So it's like hidden and everything. It's in testing again, just in Canary for now, but it honestly looks really cool. Um, yes, I mean, it's a new Edge browser, right? So it's not the um, not the old Edge, which is integrated into Windows. It's the new Edge, which is built on Chromium, which is honestly very awesome. And as soon as they release it, I will be switching from Chrome because I don't see any reason to use Chrome anymore. It has better 
integrate like it, it has better features it has like a lot more cool things and it works a lot faster than chrome it's like why would i not switch but okay there we go right so now we are coming to the releases section the first big release of the week is node.js version 12.5 and even though it is a minor release um here's the cool thing so there's two big updates to the node.js in this version the first one is the v8 is now 7.5 which i believe brings it to the parity with the chrome if i'm not mistaken let me just quick yeah so the chrome is now using seven. so this is the latest stable v8 right now and it is now in latest node.js which is awesome but this is not the highlight of the release for me at least so the notable change the biggest change is the enabling uh, v8 snapshots by default uh, and this will reduce the startup time of your um, Node.js apps quite significantly. So the idea is that once you start your application, the Node.js will make a V8 snapshot from it, right? And the next time you restart it, you'll actually use that snapshot to speed up the starting. And uh, yeah, apparently this is speeding up the start times quite damn significantly. We've, I think we've talked about this feature of a year ago if not more like they, they've initially announced the work on that quite some time ago i mean uh, this is a oh, so, so this is relatively new but i remember the discussion about it, it's like a long time ago but this finally landed and uh it seems like it's gonna be quite a speed up for the starting times i wonder like i wonder how we would compare it would be very interesting to see some benchmarks not available in linux yet really how is it not available in linux are you sure does this, I mean, it should not be platform specific, it's just a V8 snapshot, right? Uh, Unix and, uh, so the test seems to pass everywhere. So I don't, why maybe just the build is not finished? Because I remember they sometimes have these hiccups with, um, with the build tools and Windows. I mean, that's the Linux binary. Why you, sh oh, the edge, yes. The <laughs> Okay, man, don't confuse me like this. Chromium Edge, yes, it is not yet available for Linux, but I think it should be coming, right? Because there's no reason not to re uh, not to release it for Linux is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> don't worry. I was just very confused. It's like not GS is not available for Linux. That's, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> but okay, continuing. The next release we got here is Execa 2, Process Execution for Humans. Uh, exactly, if you haven't heard about it, is a very nice uh, Node.js library that basically makes it simpler to work with the child processes, the uses uh, promises, uh, allows execution of locally installed binaries without any, you know, manual resolution, essentially, cross-platform support, including shebangs and cleanup for child process when the parents exit, and there's like a bunch of other really nice features. So if you ever needed to work with a child process and note, this is basically the uh, library to use. Uh, they have added the TypeScript declaration now. So if you're a TypeScript user, then um, I guess it should be a very good news for you. There's also a bunch of other things added. So yes, if you never heard of it, definitely do have a look at it. It's now version two and uh, better than ever. V8 improve uh, may affect Telecron app too. Um, I mean, V8 uh, improvements will absolutely affect Electron apps too. The only question is, what is Electron, Electron JS using now? Because as far as I remember, Electron is lagging quite significantly behind the releases of the V8. So the latest one is using 73. So that's two versions before um, the current one. And the same goes for Node.js. The beta, oh, okay. They've actually caught up. So the beta is using Chromium 67, uh, 76. Sorry, and this is actually the beta version of Chrome. Okay, and the Nightly is using Nightly. The Node.js is still 12.0, but hey. Okay, that's actually impressive. I haven't tracked it for quite some time, but they seem to be catching up essentially to the current Chromium version, which is kind of awesome. Okay, continuing, we got Preact X beta three released with a bunch of bug fixes. So if you are looking to Preact X, and uh, wanted to try updating your Preact apps to the uh, latest version. There's a beta three with a bunch of bug fixes. And uh, yeah, just, you know, try it out. Uh, the Preact X will include a lot of things like fragments, hooks, and all other things that you would expect from Preact, I guess. Uh, so if you are interested, do check it out. Okay. And uh, I think this is the last release we got here today is the Firefox for Android preview. 
So if you have an Android phone and if you are interested in Firefox, I would encourage you to install the Firefox preview and try it out. Now, what do you expect? So this is not a complete Firefox browser. This is essentially a technical demo for the Firefox engine, uh, Firefox Quantum, right? So they are, they brought Firefox Quantum to Android and they released this preview app, which essentially is just the engine itself that renders the website with a title bar um, to test it out and see how it behaves on a various Android phones. So if you are interested, do test it, do check it out. It's actually fast as hell like this. I was seriously impressed. So they actually managed to make it feel, I guess, even faster than the Chrome does on my phone, which is impressive on its own. Um, again, you know, it's a preview build, so it doesn't include stuff like add-ons and everything. I hope they will have it in the final build. It doesn't support progressive web apps right now, for example. So it's a very, very early preview, and it looks like they just focused on testing the quantum engine itself rather than everything else. But if you're interested, do check it out. It is really fast, as I said, and really awesome. So I'm quite excited to see the next version of Firefox that is going to be powered by quantum engine. All right, um, that is it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. We got uh, quite a bit of them here. First one is Gravitol. I, I hope I'm reading this correctly. It's actually, um, I mean, it is JavaScript library or I guess library for the web, let's put it this way, but it's written in Rust. It's a 2D soft body engine. And um, you can, it's, it's like, it's insane. Like it's it literally so it's obviously since it's Rust you know it's compiled to WebAssembly, but it simulates the soft bodies and does it in a very high frame rate manner. So um, if you were I don't know if you're working with games or maybe you needed soft body engine for something, now you can take this one. It, it looks really cool and um, oh maybe you just wanted to build your own and see how it was built or you know learn from it, which is also quite a good thing. And uh, there's, yeah, there's the playground. You can tweak all the knobs and values and it, it is, it is crazy, but uh, there you go. <laughs> Next thing we got here is Firespace, easy bindings for Firebase uh, dot database. So it's a bit simpler way of you working with Firebase uh, DB, which, uh, you know, sometimes can be a bit cumbersome. The API they have is not exactly easy. This one just simplifies it in a few convenient methods. So if you're working with Firebase and wanted a simpler way of doing this, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. The next thing we got here is unmute iOS audio, enable unmute web audio in iOS, even when the mute switch is on, which is uh, quite amusing. So it seems like there's a hack to unmute web audio even when the mute switch on the phone is physically on, it still requires user interaction, bear that in mind. So you cannot like, you know, abuse it and play ads with audio anyway. So it still requires user interaction, but you can enable audio anyway, which is a bit silly, but hey, this is, a, this is actually a thing. Next thing we got here is a dip merge, a library for dip recursive merging of JavaScript objects. So if you ever needed to merge objects deeply recursively, including arrays, nested arrays, nested objects, and so on and so forth, this library allows you to do that. I guess can be useful in some cases. Um, I personally typically use Lodash because it's just you know, more battle tested, I guess, but Maybe this works fine as well. I don't know. I just never seen that before. It seems quite old actually and used by quite a lot of projects as well. So they... next thing we got here is big int serializer, a transcoder for serializing JavaScript big int values into a uint8 array or any other array like object. Um, I guess that will be useful for transferring over web sockets or something like this, because I believe you can't actually just throw it in there. It's probably going to be, you know, not won't quite work as you would expect it to. So yeah, if you're working with big ins and have a need to encode and decode them, I guess encoding them to store them in database would also be a quite nice use case unless it, it's a question. Is there actually any databases that supports big in storage? It's a good question. I never actually thought about that because I never had to work with big ins. But yes, there you go. So this library allows you to encode and decode them into byte arrays, which is quite handy. Next thing we got here is Svelte Adapter. Uh, use Svelte components with Vue and React. If you're crazy and you want to include Svelte components right into your React or Vue apps, you can now with this adapter, which looks incredibly simple, to be honest. Um, yeah, I'm not, not exactly sure why you would want to combine those two, but 
if you ever need to do, you, you now can uh, for some reason. And the next thing we got here is Harriet. JavaScript library for parallel code execution. A really nicely looking library for handling worker threads. Um, for some, like they're using the word thread here, but you know, a bit confusing because worker threads are not exactly threads and not exactly uh, parallel. I mean, okay, you know what? This is all terminology. I won't delve into it. But anyway, if you wanted a simpler way to working with worker threads, uh, with workers and parallel execution of stuff in JavaScript, then look at this. There's some really nice uh, methods here that will help you to do this stuff in a, a bit more convenient way than the worker threads do themselves. Okay, next thing we got here is React X Starter. React Redux and React Native Star Kit. Well, let me try that again. React Redux React Native Starter Kit with reusable business logic. So essentially it's a starter kit that showcases you how to share logic between the React and React Native app. And uh, it sort of includes this simple to-do app here that you can extend to whatever you want, which is quite nice. So if you were looking into building the React and React Native app that shares the business logic, then do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is a password leak, a library to check for compromised passwords, a pretty nice wrapper for have I been pound API, which if you never heard about, uh, again, I will not stop shilling for this service ever. It's an amazing service where you can enter your email and as soon as there is a public breach, they will notify you and tell you, hey, your email is actually in the breach and you might wanna change the password for this account, which is super convenient. And you can also search for your email and see what breaches your email was in. Um, I've actually been in the breaches that I honestly never, of services that I honestly never heard about. So I'm not sure how my email is there, but um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And now you can programmatically check for the compromised passwords. Uh, so essentially it also allows you to check against passwords. If a user enters a password that is already being compromised, you can just tell the user, hey, this password is actually compromised. So please use something else because it's gonna be in a brute force library attack and you're gonna get pound, right? Is uh, quite nice. So if you're running a service, make sure to, uh, I guess, I mean, it's, it's very convenient to use it, right? And uh, make sure that your user's passwords are just a tiny bit more resilient. Next thing we got here is Funk Farm, a browser extension to create serverless functions from code snippets. I'm, st I'm still not sure why would you want to do that, but it sounds like a pretty neat um, thing to be able to try out. So essentially it allows you to select a snippet on Stack Overflow and then immediately run it on Amazon Web Services from your browser. Again, in my head, that sounds like an absolutely terrible idea, but maybe you know why you would want that. <laughs> So it's uh, nonetheless, you know, as an open source tool, that's a uh, pretty nice uh, learning material, I would say. So if you're interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is dark mode JS, a utility package for managing dark mode on the web. A pretty nice uh, JS tool to essentially enabling dark mode support for your website that is extremely easy to use. So uh, if you are looking to support dark mode on your website and uh, we're looking for an easy way to do this, then do check this one out. Seems to be working on Windows 10 and Mac, and I don't know if Linux actually supports dark mode natively now, but uh, there you go. Okay, next thing we got here is Talquay. Tal I'm not sure how to read this correctly, so I'm just gonna say Talquay, a view components to build web forms looking like a conversation. The idea is that yes, it's kind of a web form, but it looks like a conversation. First of all, I would say that personally, I would immediately leave from a form like this because I read about four times faster than a typing. And second of all, I'm not sure how it works with accessibility because this should be always a thing you have to keep in mind when working with forms. But uh, as a learning material on how to build something like this, it might be actually quite nice. So if this looks interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is ActJS Flicking, a reliable, flexible, and extensible carousel used by 30 million people every day, which is you know impressive on its own. And uh, it is a very cool looking carousel. And I think my JavaScript is blocked, so it's not working properly. <laughs> Let me fix that, there you go. It actually allows you to do carousels through all directions and they're all working with like, you know, 
touch input and everything and there's like a bunch of projects using them for crazy things so if you are looking for a full feature carousel to use in your app there's also some very fancy examples over here do check this one out it seems to be really really good next thing we got here is sublet a reactive lenses for data subscriptions um, essentially allows you to wrap any object to observe the changes on it and to react on them so essentially turn any objects into observable um, via callback obviously in this case and uh, in this case the cool part is that you know you would like, immediately if you ever heard about proxies yes this works via proxy and proxy can be lazy so you don't have to predefine properties the cool thing is it also has a legacy version that works without proxy but there are some caveats like for example you have to define the properties explicitly before you wrap it otherwise it won't be able to monitor them and uh, yeah nonetheless you know it's a really neat library so if you ever needed to monitor anything reactively that do check it out it's also uh, it's from uh, mr luke edwards who's uh, famous for his super tiny libraries so the proxy version is just 194 bytes and the legacy version is just 263 bytes so yes it is quite nifty so if you needed something like this do check it out uh, next thing we got here is registry js a simple and opinionated library for working with the windows registry i like I never had to work with Windows Registry to be honest at all, even when I when I work with the desktop um, desktop apps. But maybe you do, and maybe you needed to do this from JavaScript, Electron, Node.js, or something. This seems to be a pretty nice wrapper around it. So uh, yeah, if you need to work with Windows Registry, do check this one. Next thing we got here is Bliss JS. Uh, when you want to use a vanilla JS, but native API are a bit unwieldy, so sort of a very lightweight, I guess, syntactic sugar around native APIs like query selector and animations and property setting that just makes your code a bit nicer. I guess, yeah, if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It's like not, yeah, no, I wouldn't say, I mean, it does make it nicer, but I wouldn't say it's significantly nicer. And again, they compare fetch like they use fetch API in their example, but XHR API in the native example, which is like, we have fetch already, could have used that. But uh, maybe you were looking for something like this, so uh, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Mavo or Mavo. I'm not sure how to read this again. <laughs> Some of those libraries names are just impossible to read. So uh, let's call it Mavo. It's a um, way to write dynamic HTML apps with basically just HTML. It's a library from Netlify. Uh, no, sorry, not the, um, ah, it's hosted by, okay. I originally thought it was from Netlify, but I'm mistaken. It's actually hosted by Netlify, but it's made by Lia Vero and some other people. It looks interesting uh, because essentially it's a template language that makes stuff dynamic, I guess. But yeah, I'm not sure why I would work with that over, again, React or Vue, for example, but it's interesting. So let me just put it this way. Uh, the cool part is that basically accessible from the get-go. It's friendly for text readers and keyboard accessible from the start. So maybe this is uh, one of the selling points, I guess. So if you're curious, do check it out. I mean, it, the examples are pretty cool and it seems like it's very easy to get started with. Again, I would probably still stick with React, but... Uh, all right, next thing we got here is elliptic, fast elliptic curve cryptography in plain JavaScript. Uh, so if you were looking to do elliptic cryptography in JavaScript, uh, then there you go. That's a pretty good library. Supports majority of the, um, I think not all algorithms that the elliptic cryptography, blah, blah, blah. it is hard to say elliptic cryptography for some reason. But uh, yes, there you go. So it's a library for elliptic cryptography in plain JavaScript. So you can actually use it across all platforms. If you are looking for something like this, do check it out. It's also super popular and apparently I was living in a bunker all this time and <laughs> never heard about it. All right, next thing we got here is TWGL, a tiny WebGL helper that allows you to work with WebGL in a slightly nicer manner than doing it natively because, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, WebGL is a bit cumbersome and this makes it a bit nicer. A lot of math in that lib. I mean, what do you expect from cryptography lib? It's a crypto, right? Crypto is all math, essentially. Like, what, what did you expect to see inside of it? Okay, continuing. Oh yeah, this is two of my favorites. So there's actually two things that are related to each other. 
First one is this plastic, uh, plastic, what no, play classic dot games websites that allows you to play classic games in your website. Uh, sorry, in your browser. So you can play th uh, stuff like Theme Hospital, Heroes of Might and Magic 2, Warcraft 2, Sid Meier's Civilization, and a bunch of others right in the browser. So you just click on it, it will load the page, uh, you click play, it will load the game, and then you will start playing. Now the way it works is actually the full DOS box is compiled to WebAssembly exactly and uh, runs the whole game in a WebAssembly backend which actually works surprisingly well. Like it's not an incredible performance and I'm sure there's like a bunch of optimizations that can be made to make it better, but it does work. And uh, for some reason not, ah, there we go. I should have to click and it does work. There's sound, you can play the whole bloody game like this. And uh, especially for, you know, stuff like Heroes of Might and Magic, it actually works quite well, which is uh, pretty amazing. They was achieved by taking DOSBox and uh, compiling it using Imscripton for WebAssembly and it seems like it, yeah, again, it's working really well. So if you're curious how it was made, have a look at this mDOSBox port and if you just wanted to play games, then go ahead and just play some games because those are some really good games, to be honest. Right, next thing we got here is proposal block params. A stage one proposal for JavaScript that is heavily inspired by Kotlin, Ruby and Groovy that allows you to write domain specific languages to be developed in user land essentially. So the idea is that uh, you can use parents to write uh, function calls like this. So you would write function and then you just parents, which would translate into a function call that basically takes a callback, which is, I know at first it looks a bit weird and you would be like, why would you need that? Why not just write a function call? But uh, if you're interested, there is actually a ton of examples that they outline here below that show you why this could be quite powerful. Now, the interesting thing is that on its own, it's actually not uh, like, I mean, yeah, okay. On its own, it still kind of allows you to do quite a lot of things, but together with some additional um, syntaxes that are still in other proposals, basically in JavaScript, this, can be incredibly powerful and allow building pretty crazy DSL uh, in JavaScript itself without any third party modifications, which could be quite awesome. But nonetheless, it is quite interesting to see a proposal like this making its way into the uh, JavaScript. Again, it's already stage one, which is interesting because I did not, I do not remember seeing it as stage zero at all. I guess it just progressed. It, did it, I mean, I guess it progressed that fast that it did, ever was at stage zero maybe, or I guess it was the, oh, it is this old. I just, okay. I'm just an idiot and haven't heard about it and haven't seen it at stage zero, but uh, I guess now it reached stage one. Uh, but yeah, nonetheless, very interesting. Very curious to see how that develops. Again, if you are confused by when would you want that and how would you use that, there is a ton of examples that demonstrate it very nicely. So if you are curious do check it out. Okay, last thing we got here is the ops build and run nanos unikernels and it's not strictly JavaScript. So this is actually a tool for building unikernels based on different languages. Uh, the cool thing is that it has the JavaScript unikernel support so you can actually uh, build a Node.js based unikernel from your code and uh, then run it in a um, tiny container essentially. Uh, if you are curious about unikernels and wanted to play around with them and wanted to do the JavaScript ones, do check this one out. It's actually pretty cool. All right, that is it for the libraries and demos. I have a couple of uh, pretty cool things to close this off. The first one is the track this dot link project from Mozilla, which essentially messes with your advertiser history. So the way it works is uh, quite simple. You have four personas that you can pick here. And uh, one is Hyperbeast, Filthy Reach, Doomsday, and Influencer. All of them have like more detailed description. Like, you know, the Hyperbeast is the guy who basically obsessed with streetwear, exclusive kicks, and the latest music. And uh, once you click on any of those personas and you click track this, it will open 100 plus tabs in your browser, which will basically mess up all your search and browsing history and all the advertisers will think that you are this persona, which is absolutely hilarious, to be honest. You can also be filth reach or doomsday prepper if you want to. 
and then uh, see what kind of ads you will get once you do this. It's an amusing thing, but you know, I'm, I guess in my case, I would not, it would not have any impact because I block majority of third party cookies and then I block additional tracking through the U matrix and U block origin. So, uh, but yeah, it's an interesting experiment nonetheless. And the last thing, which I think is absolutely awesome that I want to highlight here today, it's actually a bit JavaScript related as well, uh, is a website Learn Thins from the Ableton. They made a website that basically introduces you to the synthesizers and allows you to learn how they work. Um, it also ha uses the Web Audio API to um, simulate synthesizers right in the browser. There's like a ton of things. They introduce you to basically everything about the synths, including you know the basics, envelopes, LFOs, oscillators, filters, and then there's a playground where you can actually tweak all of those things. And um, they have a preset as well, so you can actually turn stuff on and then start tweaking things to see how that would affect the music, which is really, really cool. And all of that is done in the browser using Web Audio API. So if you have a slightest interest in synths, make sure to go through this. The tutorial itself is actually really cool. I wish we had something like this in the university when I was studying the you know signals and sound waves because that would make it a whole lot easier to learn. But uh, hey, nonetheless, it's really awesome. Okay, uh, it is an amazing educational tool. Like it's not just about the examples, the text itself, like the tutorials are really well written. So if you wanted to learn about synthesizer and sound waves specifically, I guess, it's a really good starting point. But okay, this is actually it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly episode 69. As usual, you can find all the mentioned links on the bxjs.dev website or on GitHub. Um, if you missed anything, you, there will be a VOD on Twitch immediately or on YouTube after a couple of hours once I re-upload it there. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. You guys have... <clears throat> God damn it, sorry. <laughs> if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them right now into the chat. I will be more than happy to answer. Uh, if you have any articles that I might have missed or you have your own libraries you want to share, Throw them into the chat right now, or if you're watching a VOD of this, uh, join our Discord server and share it with me over there. Um, you can also tweet it to me or whatever. I will be more than happy to cover your stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, <clears throat> I guess that's basically it from my side. Uh, your opinion, PVA is the future. Uh, absolutely, I think progressive web apps will get more and more powerful and the more access they will get to the or hardware that basically we need in you know everyday day-to-day -day lifestyle um, then the less native apps we'll have i mean i already replaced skype uh, discord uh, what else telegram messaging apps uh, google drive whatever all of them are pvas and in this case you know i have the discord for example as the this is running in browser right now so I'm not i don't even have it installed i have it in my browser and this is effectively Chrome. So you can see all my plugins here, but it runs as a separate window. And once the progressive app apps will actually have access to the file system, for example, which has been in proposals for like ages, we won't even need to install anything. So uh, yeah, I think progressive app apps are definitely the future and I'm really looking forward to seeing how they will develop. Trying to get Socket.io to work with Express.js. Uh, the example works, but when I try to use require or import, it won't work on the client side. Uh, when I use Webpack or Parcel, I mean, if you need require or import, so the client side, the browser doesn't know about require keyword, right? So require keyword is a Node.js only thing. You can use import keyword, but then the module, so you have to use it inside the uh, ES module um, tag, right? Uh, there's the Mozilla, so as usual, go to MDN and just have a look at the import. Uh, it has to be within the script type module tag to work. And the module you import has to be an ES format as well. I'm not sure if Socket.io actually has ESM uh, bundle. I'm guessing not. So the easiest way for you would be to, yes, use something like Parcel or Webpack. I mean, Webpack would be a bit more hustle to set up. So just go ahead and use Parcel. That would solve all your problems. Essentially, uh, but yeah, essentially is the problem is browser does not know require or import keywords. And if you use ES modules, then you would need to import other ES modules, which Socket.io probably doesn't have. Um, okay. 
Right. Um, any other questions or suggestions or stuff? If not, then we can wrap this up here. I'm going to go die in a corner because it's getting extremely hot here. Uh, we're going to get plus 38 tomorrow again. So I'm just going to be lying somewhere in a deep, dark, cold corner, trying not to die from the heat stroke. Um, but yeah, <laughs> let us end this on a positive. All right. So... Um, I guess that's it. No more questions from you guys. So again, if you are, have any other questions and you did not get a chance to ask them or you want to ask them uh, later on, feel free to join our Discord server and ask them there. Either I or our awesome community will be able to help you there. Uh, that's basically it from my side. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you are not dying from the heat strokes over there. Um, yeah, thank you for your continued support. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching a VOD of this. And I see you next time. Bye.